Well, then I'll, I think I'll get started and welcome um, all of our guests to this webinar um, on black ash, cultural and forestry practices um, in the face of emerald ash borer. Um, my name is Alaire Diamond. I'm an ecologist at Vermont Land Trust, and I have been in love with black ash for as long as I've known about it as a tree. So I just want to welcome everybody here tonight, um, and thank you for taking time on this beautiful spring evening to join us for this gathering. Um, and really, it's, it's just a very special place for a sharing of knowledge from across our region. And all of, all of our presenters tonight will be focusing on resilience and adaptation in the face of emerald ash borer and its threat to black ash or brown ash, as it's also called. Um, I am really deeply honored to be part of this conversation. And we're going to be hearing from a basket maker as well as researchers and practitioners who are currently working on ash biology and management. And it's particularly, particularly special um, to be here tonight because our presenters represent several Wabanaki nations for whom black or brown ash is a very important tree. Um, and some, our presenters represent the Milhican Band of the Kusuk Abenaki Nation of the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe the Aristic Band of Micmacs and the Penobscot Nation. And I, I want to say that I will probably not get this right, but I do want to take a moment just to acknowledge that we here in Vermont, where I am, are on occupied Abenaki land, um, part of Indakana. Um, our guests are joining us from occupied as well as tribal lands of the Mohawk, Micmac, Penobscot, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy Nations. And we honor the sacred relationship that you have to this land. So we will be hearing from, five, I guess, five guests here tonight um, who will, will speak to us about different aspects of black ash um, and their work with it. And we're going to begin with Carrie Wood, who is an Abenaki um, basket maker, traditional Abenaki basket maker in Vermont. She's a member of the Milhigan Band of the Kusuk Abenaki Nation. Carrie is going to welcome us. Um, and she will share a bit about the cultural significance of black ash to the Abenaki people. And then I think she will, when, she, when Carrie is finished, we're going to hear um, a, a welcome Thanksgiving also from Les Benedict, who is the assistant director for the environmental division for the St. Regis Mohawk tribe in Aquasasne, New York. And then as each of our presenters finish, I'll come back on and introduce our next guest. Um, you all, all of our guests here tonight um, who are not presenting, all of the rest of you in our audience are muted and your videos are off. And we welcome you to share questions in the questions section on your dashboard, um, which is part of the sort of list of options on the dashboard. Share questions there. And at the very end, after everybody has finished presenting, we'll have some time to, to ask each of our presenters some questions. Um, if you have any issues with the, the program, um, if you can't see or hear, you can put a message in the chat and we'll try to help you as best we can. So with that, I want to turn this over to Carrie. Welcome, Carrie. Well, Yoni, Leo, thank you so much. I'd like to start with singing a Mi'kmaq honor song by George Paul, which has been translated into the Western Abenaki language by Jesse Bouchak. Beta beta hodo no da, pony al ni o no bai o di, ak ni ti al no ba ma mo i ja. Beta beta hodo no da, pony wada ba zo di, ak ni ti al no ba ma mi jo kong do di ja, e jo kong di ja, Tony Kitsi ni was. Let us consider how great it is that we are people. My fellow people, let us come together. Let us consider our great roots. My fellow people, let us help one another. Let us help one another how the great spirit intended when putting us here on the earth. Leoni and Les, if you would share the Thanksgiving address. Yes, uh, thank you, Carrie. 
if I could have the uh, uh, share feature, I could would appreciate that. Uh, the protocol is typically for the host nation to provide the Thanksgiving address. And um, I've been I received the honor of, of making the Thanksgiving address. I wanted to put up uh, a picture of my my friend and co-worker throughout the years, uh, Mr. Richard David, as I go through the Thanksgiving address. The Thanksgiving address is used to open up um, proceedings in our territory, and it's called the words before all else, and our language is called called and it acknowledges all of the people and the beings. So I, I'll begin, it'll take a, a little while. I'll make the shortened version. Onus Zedawayo, Seos, Gantar, Tayoko, Ibi, Kale, Wayan, Dakwa, Ne, Oba, Kale, Wadegwa, Ne, Ganu, Wala, Wala, Dunsa, Aguego, Anskat, Ne, G, Andawa, Way, Noni, Ne, Ungwa, Neguna, Donu, Dea, Tinu, Waladun, Ne, Opes, Sunha, Aguego, Anska, Ne, G, Underway, Wa, Way, Noni, Ne, Ungwa, Neguna, Donu, Dea, Tion, De Waladun, Ne, Yungi, Nistan, Oweste, Gia, Aguego, Anska, Ne, G, Underway, Way, Noni, Ne, Ungwa Nikungwa Dano De Tiun Nu Walado Ne Kani Ka Kyo Chi Yo Wan Chiade Aguego Anska Neji E Di Wan Wa Ti We no Noni Ne Ungwa Nikuma Dano De Tinu Wal Walado Ne Kanijan Gunsa a gun de nagale ne awega. Aguego anska ne ji ande wa we nuni ne ungwa ne gunla. Danu de ya te nun wulado ne ohun shunji a danu ne agua de gun wadi guane ane. Diu qua nene oneste osa heta danu ona lutsala. A guego hospit ne ji adi wa we nuni ne ungwa nigo la danu dea tiu te walado ne ungwa sunga. A guego hospit ne ji under we wa nuni ne ungwa nigo la danu. Dea Tununi Walado, Ne Kahigo Santa, Dan de Agua, Dagun Wadiga, Nan, Ne Neot Hoots, etc. Aguego Aska Neji, Andawa Wanuni, Ne Ungwa Naguna, Danu Dea Tunu Walado, Ne Odi Nutsuha. Aguego, Oscar Neji, Andewe Wong, Wanuni only, Guang Naguma Danu, Dea Tinu Walado, Ne Kalayo Tayusa, Danu Ne, Ne Aguatu, Mari Kawonu, Ne Oscanuda. Aguego, Oscar Neji, Andewe Wong, Nanuni Ne, Unguat Naguma, Danu. Dea Tanun Waladum, Ne Kalun Unka A Danu, Ne Ne Agua, Taguna Wadega Wana, Ne Owata Aguego Aska de G. Adaway Wa Wanuni, Ne Ungua de Gola Danu Dea Tanun Waladum, Ne Ojin A Oguna. Danu ne agua, tukun wadigwa ne ne adun doyon 
kowa akwe ngo aska ne gi ande we wa we nonuni ne ongwa ne gunla donu de ye de tunu ne weladu ne kayeli ne kwa ne ga welage akwe ngo aska ne gi ande wa we nonuni ne ongwa ne gunla donu de ye tunu welado ne yungo son so togo a lari wales a kwego master di ando ando we wa wenu ne yungo ne gumula dano de 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 shita wenu welado ne yungo wati a kalakwa a kwego aska ne di ando we wa wenu ne ngwa nikona dano de ye tinu wal waladu ne dugu sota kalakwa akwego aska de ni ji ando we wa wanuni ne ngwa nikona dano de ye tinu waladu ne yo ji tu ko kwa kwa yo ji de ga no hayate Aguego has got me the other way one when you know me, eh, Ungua Nigun. Dono, the sister, well, well, I don't know, school, well, well, the do, do so. Eto, Nium, do, Hark, ne, Ungua Nigun. Anton, Eto, no, the better what the login name, G. Nahoda, E. E. Galloway. This is just a, a, a thank you and a welcoming. I've done my best to uh, fulfill my responsibility that was given to me by Carrie. If I've forgotten something, uh, maybe you can give your own Thanksgiving in your own way. So at this point, Dono, Eto, Nigola, Nage, Dono, Ono, Eto. These are the words, and all that is, and we can begin. Thank you, Les. Hichiyulini. Yes. Uh, Leo, if um, I can scale the screen, then I can go on. I need a walk. Half of no goes on. In the Louise Kelly Abazi and the Biodwa, a la Kerry Wood English Morning Group. In Dain, Colchester, Vermont, as a GB Peter Boat, Naki Float, Wazi Zibi, Nidakana Uzi Wabanaki, El Nobak. Ho ho friends, greetings. I'm called Kerry about Kelly Abazi in the Banaki, but Kerry Voice Wood in English. I'm presently in Colchester, Vermont, near Lake Champlain, the lake between. It's the western edge of our land of the Wabanaki people. I am a member of the Nohegan Hoosic Abenaki Nation. Prior to European contact, the western Abenaki people inhabited what is now known as Vermont, New Hampshire, part of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Maine, and Quebec, along the Lake Champlain and St. Lawrence Seaways in the Connecticut River. Yet, in our Indian Bana, Eo Dali. We are still here. 
Mahalakwasak of Aziak, the black ash trees, hold significance for our people. Mahalaks is El Nombok. El Nombok, Moskizik, Mahalakwasi, quote, the Abanaki people who emerge from the ash. I'm going to share a story. When Talbadok, the owner creator, made the world, he made the mountains, the trees, and the animal people. But something was missing. The earth was not complete. He decided it was time to make the human beings. He looked around for something to shape them with. There were the stones. He piled stones large and high and breathed the wind of life into them. He stirred the spirits of the stones to wake. The stones rose and began to move. They were large and strong and walked the earth with terrible power. But they were hard and unfeeling. They did not care where they stepped. The owner creator was not pleased. He shook the earth until the stone people were destroyed. Talbadoc decided to try again. This time he chose to shape the people from the ash tree. Their skins were soft and they breathed in all of life. They shared their breath with all living things. Their limbs were supple and strong and they danced like leaves in the wind. They say Talbadoc shot an arrow into the ash tree and out came people of all colors, red, white, yellow, brown, and black. As you can see the colors in the wood of a freshly harvested tree today, in the Alakwiwak, the growth rooms. El Nobak, Moskizizik, Mahlawaksikok, the Abanaki people who emerge from the ash. Kichi Uliuni for Jesse Bruchek for the telling of the story. They say there are still stone people among us today. Those who do not care for all our relations and see Mother Earth as a commodity to be used for personal gain. And there are still tree people. Those who understand we are all related and our actions affect all today and future generations. We should only harvest what is needed. We must give things and share our gifts. The Abanaki in many other Northeast woodland nations, rely on black ash for making traditional and contemporary baskets and on other ash trees for snowshoes, canoe rooms, and tools. My great grandmother, Calvino Bobsalin, and her siblings, Malion and William Simon, made a meager living as basket makers from the early to mid 1900s, residing in Thompson's Point, Shalot, Vermont. It is basket making and my ancestors speaking from the ash that provide a window into my family history and culture and started my journey of reclaiming who I am and from whence I come. You see, I share a story with many who are Abanaki in Vermont. I grew up in an average middle class white American. My maiden name is Royce. In school, I and even my children have been taught that no indigenous people ever lived in Vermont. They just passed through. The Abenaki people were invisible. My grandfather was born Ellsworth Clarence Royce of Omsalin. He was raised by his mother and her family in the Abenaki ways. Yet it was not an easy time to be identified as an Indian in Vermont. My grandfather experienced prejudice and discrimination in grade school and saw firsthand the impact of the eugenics movement. When he returned from serving in World War II, he legally changed his name from Obamsalin to the name of his stepfather, Royce. Ellsworth's original birth certificate lists him as an Indian. His revised birth certificate in 1945 lists him as white. My grandfather made a very difficult choice due to the climate of the world. He wanted what we all want for our families, a chance for making a decent living and to be safe in the world we live. For the future of his family, my grandfather felt he had to choose to leave behind his Abanaki heritage. He never spoke of being Abanaki to me. The past is the past. It is not to be spoken of. Yet, he taught me much of the ways of the Abanaki and how he lived. He deeply respected all our relations. He only took what was needed to feed his family. He wasted nothing. He always gave up his time and shared his knowledge. 
When I was in high school, I visited my great aunt Nettie, my grandfather's youngest sister. She had beautiful small baskets all around her home. It was Aunt Nettie who first told me of our family being a Banneke as she shared the stories of her childhood and how my great grandmother made and sold these baskets. Nettie's daughter, Jeannie Brink, learned how to make traditional Banneke baskets with Sophie Nalat from Odenat at a time when few basket makers remained in Vermont. Jeannie has gone on to teach 27 apprentices, all a Banneke, how to make these baskets. I had the privilege to serve as an apprentice under Jeannie Brink to learn a Banneke ash and sweet grass basket making with two of my children starting in 2013. When I started, it was simply an interesting part of my family heritage. Yet, as I processed the splints from the ash trees, pounding the log, peeling the strips, separating the strips, gauging to size, and finally, let's go on up, leaving the splints. I discovered I was on a transformative journey. Ash and basketry teach patience, perseverance, resilience. They provide medicine for the soul and finances for the family, and they connect the Alnoba with their culture. As I wove the baskets, I felt as if my ancestors were reaching out to me. Jeannie shared stories. I started to learn El Nobayodwa, the language of the Western Abanaki people. My perspective shifted to recognizing that I am but a part of the life circle amongst all my relations. And all of life is about these relations. I started the journey to reclaim what has been lost for three generations due to my grandfather's difficult choices. In Dain Bina Iodali, we are still here. For me, the black ash has brought me home to my people. Ash is critical to who we are. I am teaching my children and grandchildren how to process ash and make baskets. For our culture to survive and thrive, my children need the black ash available so they may teach their children and their grandchildren. I share my story as the Abenaki of Vermont have a unique situation amongst the Northeast Woodland tribes. While we are still here, it has been a long journey for others to acknowledge this. As colonial settlers arrived in Vermont, many with the land grants awarded because of their participation in the French and Indian Wars, the King Philip's War, some Abenaki in Vermont went further north into the Missisquoi Mission and on to Odenac now an Abenaki First Nation reservation in, Vermont, in Quebec. But most Abenaki simply blended in. They tried to continue to live where they have always been. They became known as the Gypsies and the River Rats. Four of the Abenaki tribes in Vermont finally received Vermont state recognition in 2011 and 2012. A full decade has not yet passed. We do not have ownership of tribal land. We do not have groves of ash trees. We do not all live in the same community. We do not have federal recognition. Therefore, we have no federal dollars to help combat the impact of the Emerald Ash War. We do have obligations. I have an obligation to remember those who have gone before me, to serve the past, present, and future generations, to share what I have learned about Abazadoka basket making, and thus, about being a Banaki. There are only a few Abnaki basket makers remaining in Vermont. I hope to change that and continue what Jeannie Brink started to teach others the Abanaki way of basketry. The Abanaki community in Vermont will not be successful in saving seeds, protecting trees, protecting the ecosystem that the black ash trees uniquely support, creating solutions for future generations by ourselves. There are not enough of us. We have no financial resources. I have hope as Vermonters are beginning to recognize in Diabana Iadali. We will need partnerships with our neighbors across Vermont and in New Hampshire, for they have the same challenges and no state recognition. If we can educate those who own the land where the ash trees grow, how to identify their trees, teach them that there are possibilities for treatments for the EAB, Ask if they choose to harvest a black ash tree to reach out to the indigenous communities before holding it up. We may be able to prepare splint for future generations 
and to discover solutions for Maha Locks to be made for our grandchildren's grandchildren. I want to end with a poem which was written by Joseph Bouchak. Abasna Doal. Wali get Abasno da Gadal and then all. Abasno got to cot. Ujiao no bi kasakwad less than a wa wa bani bi kasiwi. A good basket holds its maker's hands like fingers knit together. Less gana woganao uzi vipiak gagiana logiado awanak. We unigi wuho hedeguo woban uji aguan bi we all. Inspiri uli mugil skokikal tapak rocks wani bago. Splints of pounded ashwood grasp a shape in air, coiling around the circle of seasons with sweet grass and cattail leaves in the weeds. Mini guiba awakogana ulito abasnoda logioda undaba uprozoia kasiwi niwasku uzi abazi miskipo. Although machines make basket shapes, they cannot speak to the spirits of the wood or the grass. As on us for Uzi Nado Dama, Upakawa Dama Po, the Gal Namenawa, Kasigaran Tanazi Mizitabik Awoganao, Tayolawi El Noba Kizi Tony Adozi, Laskana Wa Kizikla, Tasogli Zi Ta La Wibo Zoal, Piti Ha Ta Kagalna. The weeds and ask them to agree to hold the years and all the loads the way a human being can when the weed is swift and the patterns catch and hold a song. I so appreciate the Vermont Urban Community Forestry Program hosting this program. I look forward to hearing from the other presenters. Kitsi Uli Uni, great thanks. Uli Nana Walmazik. Take good care of yourselves. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Les, for grounding us in the land and with this tree and its rich history, the people, the families, and the connections that this tree has brought together and has woven together um, with the help of of skilled artisans and, and people for generations. Um, I'm happy now to introduce Tyler Everett. Tyler is a citizen of the Aristic Band of Micmacs. Um, he is a forester and he's currently pursuing his PhD at the University of Maine with Dr. John Daigle. He is, um, his research is an expansion of work he started um, as when he did his master's degree research um, focusing on developing a tribal brown ash inventory protocol. So the focus of his work has now shifted to adaptive management strategies for emerald ash borer. Um, today he will share with us some of the protocol that he's developed. Welcome, Tyler. Thank you, Alaire. Uh, thank you uh, for the land acknowledgement and then thank you, Carrie, for the song and powerful presentation and bless for the uh, Thanksgiving. That was uh, really great. I think it's becoming a common thing on these presentations to do that. And uh, it's great to see. So I'm going to sh share my screen here. Are you seeing my screen? <laughs> there we go. Oh, yep, I can see it. Yeah, we see it. <clears throat> All right, sorry about that. Uh, good evening. My name is Tyler Everett, a Wabanoke Week Mi'kmaq. I am a person of the dawn. I am Mi'kmaq. Uh, as Alaire said, I'm a citizen of the Aroostook Band of Mi'kmaqs, and I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Maine. I'm working with my advisor, John Daigle, and fellow student 
uh, Emily Francis on brown ash related research. I also work part time for United South and Eastern Tribes or USET as the forest adaptation technical assistant. Uh, and then lastly, I, I spent a fair amount of time in the woods working as a field forester for the Passamaquoddy Forestry Department. Uh, right now, I'm working on some formal inventory of brown ash wetland forests on Passamaquoddy tribal lands. And as Alaire said, the protocol that we're following to do that uh, was the master's degree work that I did at the University of Maine. Uh, today, I'll be giving a brief overview of that protocol, uh, which is a manual I can share with the group after the presentation. Uh, it's called Emerald Ash Borer Response and Ash Resource Inventory Field Manual. There we go. Uh, so just a brief outline of what I'll pre be presenting today. I'll first touch on the cultural significance of ash. I'll jump into a review of the three-stage inventory protocol, uh, where I'll focus on highlighting the key data collected in stages one and two. Uh, and then I'll wrap up with some future directions and closing remarks. Um, so building on what Carrie shared, which was really powerful, uh, when we think about the cultural significance of ash, uh, we can often relate it back to traditional ecological knowledge. So here in Maine, TEK uh, comes from the Wabanuaki tribal nations, the Passamaquoddy, Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Penobscot nations, all of which are connected culturally in many ways, um, such as the creation story, similar to what Carrie shared. Uh, basketry is an art. The skills needed are acquired over years of practice, and those skills are passed down from generation to generation. And so what this type of knowledge sharing does is it establishes harvesters, basket makers, and the culture keepers of ash as true stewards to the species. So why should we inventory our ash resource? Um, of course, we all know emerald ash borer is coming, so that definitely heightens the need. But the baseline knowledge needed to manage any resource revolves around knowing how much of the resource we have and where it's located. Uh, we can establish this through inventory. In the case of emerald ash borer, there's certainly a need uh, for early detection. So identifying sites to launch funnel traps, purple traps, trap trees, it's all made easier if you have inventory data for your ash stands. Inventory can also provide vital information that's useful in timing harvest of upland stands, uh, both to optimize their financial yields, but also protect any associated lowland brown ash forests. And then in general, it can simply expand our knowledge base, both on emerald ash borer, the ash tree species, and basket quality sites. And then as we consider the various adaptive management strategies for emerald ash borer, we can better improve the timing of their implementation as a part of a greater integrated pest management approach uh, once, we, once we complete these inventories. Uh, this is the basic structure of the manual. Uh, today, I want to discuss the various stages of the inventory, but we'll be putting a focus on stage two, as I think it's the most applicable to the general forestry community. Uh, before we get to stage two, we got to start with stage one. And so stage one is simply an existing data set, uh, whether that be cover type data, various remote sensing layers, or some other publicly available GIS data set. Uh, but more often than not, those data sets are simply just someone's prior knowledge that yes, this area has ash. Let's go take a closer look. So let's do that. Let's take a closer look at stage two of the inventory. Here's a map of the university forest where I performed the initial small scale case study for implementing this protocol. Here you can see the plots laid out in a grid. Inventory sampling is executed using a variable radius technique uh, with a 20 factor prism. Plots are placed roughly four chains apart, which works out to around one plot for every one and a half acres. Uh, this maintains compliance with NRCS forest inventory standards uh, in, the in the case that there might be some future cost share programs uh, for this type of work. Uh, there are two categories of data collected in stage two. There's the plot, data, plot level data. And so once you navigate to the plot, you can assess the area for these items. Uh, you'd record the plot number, aspect, slope, and elevation. Uh, these are basic pieces of information you can generally find on your GPS unit. Uh, then we want to record whether any invasive plant species are present. Uh, this is important because as ash trees succumb to EAB, 
one of the biggest threats that the next generation of ash trees can face is being choked out in the understory by invasive plants and shrubs. Uh, here at this plot, there was honeysuckle. And next, we want to record the microtopography. This is essentially the degree of pits and mounds at the site. Uh, one adaptive management strategy is to replant ash seedlings or direct seed uh, ash resources um, to help regenerate following emerald ash borer. Uh, you might plan to use a replacement species, so a non-ash species to replace brown ash at these sites to maintain forest cover. But in either case, uh, these sites, uh, the replanting efforts would be a lot easier if you knew where the microsites were in, in the areas where there were more pits and mounds. Uh, with this information collected, we can move on to the tree data sheet for stage two. So each tree you visit is given a number. Uh, this is a rolling count from plot to plot. You'd record species, diameter, given overall product designation, total height, height to crown base. And then for ash trees, you'd assess male, female, or polygamous individuals, and then assess for EAB signs and symptoms. Uh, so here is a look at what the data sheet might look like. I've circled the data that kind of strays away from the more traditional forest inventory protocols. So as you can see here, the, the tree number at this plot started at eight. And this is because we keep that rolling count for tree number. So at plot one or the plot you visited prior to this one, there were seven trees recorded. So here at this plot, we started at eight and continued to go up. I then circle tree 10 uh, because that's a height tree. In this protocol, we, we record total height, height to crown base on every 10th tree visited. And the reason I bring this up is it places no bias on the size of the tree. Right, the tenth tree could be a small four and a half inch brown ash, or it could be a 32 inch white pine. Um, whereas other inventory protocols, the tree selection for height trees usually puts a preference on larger diameter trees uh, because they're focused on um, a harvest at some point. That's not the focus here. Um, we also record the overall product. Um, it's not a typical stick cruising technique where every eight foot section of the tree is assessed for a product. Um, this is because we're not really looking to perform at harvest. And so to save time, we only collect a small subset, a good base of knowledge on, on the woodlot. And so we're giving an overall product designation to the tree of pulp, veneer, cull, etc. cetera. Um, and then ash trees are polygamodioecious. Um, so by looking at either male or female flowers or the presence of seeds, we can classify the tree as either male, female, or polygamous. And this is great information um, when it can be collected. It's sometimes challenging, especially uh, if we're focusing on seed collection efforts or making certain trees marked uh, to not be harvested. So if you're, you have a site where it's just a few uh, seed bearing ash trees present, you don't want to have those harvested by basket makers. So you might flag that tree and, and put a note on it for harvesters so they know not to harvest. Uh, we also assess every tree for EAB signs and symptoms uh, throughout the inventory process of stage two. Regardless of whether you record data on an ash tree, what we do is we encourage inventory personnel to know any time they encounter brown ash. They'll do this in the notes section um, and drop a pen on their GPS. This is important because it tells us where brown ash is occurring. A lot of these plots may fall and, and not identify where ash is. I mean, the, those grids were laid out over an area where we knew there was ash, but not every plot's gonna hit ash. Uh, so that's an important part of the protocol. Uh, we also collect regeneration data, uh, so the understory, and we'll do that for both brown ash, white ash, green ash, as well as uh, non-ash species, uh, because that's gonna tell us what the next generation of trees are at the site when emerald ash borer comes through. Um, and hopefully we can improve it over time and get more brown ash in the understory to sustain it on the landscape. So this is a picture of female flowers on a brown ash tree on the left. They're very wispy looking. Uh, eventually these would produce seed. So the picture on the right, are some late season Samaras from a brown ash. If they're producing seed, uh, they're either female or polygamous. 
Um, if they're not producing seed and they don't have the wispy flowers, um, they're likely a male individual. There's another photo of uh, female flowers on a white ash. So again, those are very wispy looking. And then this photo uh, is male flowers on a green ash. Structures are pretty consistent across green, white, and black. Um, there are some differences, um, but the distinction between male and female is pretty, pretty prevalent, right? Those are small and globular, whereas the female flowers are very wispy looking. And then if there's seed present, you know for sure it's a female or polygamous. Uh, here are the EAB signs that we look for during inventory. If these are present, because it's a sign, we know that emerald ash borer is in the area. Um, luckily, we have yet to find this on Passamaquoddy tribal lands, um, but if we saw D-shaped exit holes, uh, which are very small and difficult to see, and oftentimes at the top of the tree where emerald ash borer typically starts its infestation, uh, then we might know that there's emerald ash borer there. Uh, the actual EAB insect, either adult or larvae is another sign. The egg masses, which also are really hard to see, and so we might find those if we were sifting bark, uh, but otherwise it's not common to find those. And then the characteristic D-shaped, or sorry, uh, characteristic serpentine shaped beating galleries, that bottom photo on the left. Uh, these are the symptoms that we note for ash trees. Many of these do not necessarily mean that the tree is being impacted by emerald ash borer. Um, they could be brought on by a number of different stressors like drought, disease, or other native insects um, in borers. We look for flagging and dieback in the branches, epicormic sprouts on the main bowl or stem of the tree, a bark splitting in the main branches, uh, or woodpecker feeding, which is also known as blonding. The blonding can also be confused with like a fungal pathogen, which uh, causes ash smooth bark disease. And so that smooth bark sometimes gets confused for, for blonding. In completing stage two, um, you've inventoried a large area. And like I said, some of the plots may have had ash, some others may not have. And so it can be useful uh, to take it a step further and delineate the brown ash corridor. So that's the area where brown ash is, is occurring the most. Um, wetland data, soils information, and depth to water table data can be useful in identifying the brown ash corridor and where it's most likely occurring. Uh, then when you add in the information on plots where brown ash trees were recorded and inventory personnel noted that they encountered brown ash, um, so that was something I flagged earlier as important. Uh, with all that data together, you can start to remotely outline the area where brown ash is occurring. So this is a little closer view of that end result. And, um, and this can be a stopping point where you know where there's a significant amount of brown ash uh, and you can monitor the area, uh, buffer it with your harvest and just keep an eye on these sites, maybe open it up to basket makers. Um, but, or, or in the case of the Passamaquoddy Tribal Forestry Department, uh, we actually take it a step further and we gather a more rigorous data set uh, for the brown ash corridor where it's most abundant. That's stage three of the inventory, but due to time constraints, I'm not gonna be able to jump into that stage here. Just to wrap up, uh, moving forward, we plan to continue our inventory efforts on Passamaquoddy tribal lands. In that effort and my future research efforts, a, a big focus has been on advocating for data, data sovereignty. So the locations of, of these brown ash sites um, and the knowledge from basket makers and harvesters on brown ash have all been kind of trusted to myself, other researchers in the forestry department. And so we want to honor that trust and not misuse or share this data unethically. Uh, so that's a big part of what I do. Um, part of that future research I mentioned is going to focus on building an understanding of the behaviors of foresters, loggers, and landowners as it pertains to the management of ash and their consideration for both the ecological and cultural values that the resource has. Um, this will help identify landowners who want to get involved in these efforts. And so hopefully we can find some of those landowners that might be interested in some long-term brown ash adaptive, manage, adaptive management silvicultural trials. 
and we can start to give some information to uh, tribal forestry departments on what they might want to do on tribal lands as Emerald Ash Borer gets closer here in Maine. Well, Ali, uh, thank you. I appreciate everyone's time and I'll welcome any questions at the end of the presentations. Also drop my email in the chat, uh, but for now I'll pass it on to uh, Emily to talk about seed collection efforts. Thank you, Tyler. That was a really, that was an excellent presentation and some really interesting natural history information, both about ash and about um, EAB, and also just the connections between um, the basket making work and and basket gather basket tree um, gathering, and also the the trad more traditional forestry work. So thank you so much. Um, our next presenter is Emily Francis, and Emily I grew up in southern Vermont. And she is now a second year PhD student at the University of Maine, um, working um, with Dr. John Daigle. She has degrees in geography from Keene State College and the University of Northern Iowa. And before coming to the University of Maine, she worked with US Fish and Wildlife Service and also the National Science Foundation. So she'll be presenting a bit about her research. Welcome, Emily. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank everybody who has spoken so far and welcomed all of us. Um, it's been a, uh, a very um, informative and powerful um, discussion so far. There's the show my screen. <laughs> there we go. And can everyone see this? Perfect, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say I am a uh, third generation Portuguese American and um, like Alaire said, a uh, Vermonter who has now lived all over the place. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for joining this evening. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some seed collection efforts and moving a little bit more into the social science realm of the work that Tyler, myself, and Dr. John Daigle are working on um, with a whole host of other people who I will acknowledge at the end. So um, why collect ash seed? Um, I'd like to think that the, the people who've spoken before me have done an amazing job at um, really talking about um, why ash is important, both for uh, Wabanaki and Abenaki people. Um, and it also has importance for the state of Maine, um, just as a, a timber resource, depending on the subspecies of ash. Um, it has uh, ecological and hydrological importance for different locations, uh, depending on the subspecies in the woods. Um, and it's also an urban street tree that's found in a lot of our small towns and cities in the Northeast, as well as uh, trees that you find in your yard. Um, it is a cultural keystone species uh, that's referred to um, brown and black ash in the Gulf of Maine region. And um, so why harvest seeds? Um, it's a big part of the research and conservation efforts of surrounding the emerald ash borer um, dieback issues with the tree in the Northeast. And it's used in genetic studies for future planting, for regeneration of seeds, and for safekeeping in seed banks. And the goal of what I'm going to speak on tonight is to provide those invested in protecting this tree um, a way to be involved with the current efforts of collecting ash seed. So we've had, I noticed that Tyler also used this awesome picture of the emerald ash borer in the top left corner of the screen. These are adult emerald ash borers, which we also call EAB. As you can see, they're very small and those holes on the left of the penny are the D-shaped exit holes that um, Tyler mentioned. And on the right, you can see the green, black, and white ash leaves. Those are the three subspecies that we have in Maine and in the Northeast. There are about 16 species in North America, 
Um, they're pretty difficult. They can be difficult to tell apart. They do have different ecological habitats and um, not to go too much into detail with the, the emerald ash borer and this issue as other people have mentioned it. So I'm just gonna move on to the seed collection standard operating procedures. So um, what we have here, uh, there are standard operating procedures that have been set forth by the US Forest Service. Um, this is an excellent document in the top left. Um, that is methods for collecting ash, the fraxina subspecies seeds. It's a great document um, and it is, you know, short, sweet and to the point on the basics of collecting ash seeds. The center image is a picture of um, ash seeds that have been dried out. And on the top right, we have an example of the ash seed data collection sheet that comes along from the National Seed Collection Lab. All of these um, methods are great. We have the National Seed Lab, we have the US Forest Service, there are other agencies um, and NGOs that have come forth and provided trainings on how to collect ash seeds. But what we're really looking for is to create a living document, a document that is developed with the non-researcher in mind. And who is the non-researcher? We're looking at the um, those with the traditional and local ecological knowledge of the black brown ash, or those who know about and, and have um, knowledge of white and green ash as well. So what we're interested in is creating a document that works with um, those who haven't been included in previous documentation that's been created. Um, and we're really interested in working with um, Wabanaki basket makers, um, uh, brown ash harvesters, among others in the region who are interested in helping in this effort. So part of what I'm doing for my PhD research is creating this seed collection document that is a more inclusive process of making sure that there are more people at the table who are going to use this document um, and can work together and have more people involved in collecting seed beyond just the science researchers. So what we have is um, currently actually writing a document. And this document um, is going to be reviewed with our partners with the EAB task force, other partners that we have, basket makers, ash harvesters, not only within the Wabanaki um, community, but we also have, um, as you've heard from Les Benedict, who's with the St. Regis Mohawk tribe, he has been a huge resource in working with us so far um, as I myself have been learning about ash seed and this whole process. So we're going to be pilot testing with volunteers and seed, coll seed collector volunteers and then working on doing a revision and adaptation for eventual publication. But what we're really looking for is to create a living document, something that will be beyond um, just a static document on a web page, but something that as knowledge uh, is updated and, and we learn different things, it is um, open for revision. So I realized we have a lot of people to talk today, so I just wanted to um, give a brief overview of what we're, we're working on. And if you have any interest, you're more than welcome to contact me at my email address on the bottom right. Um, and I just want to put up uh, some of the logos of our partners and those that we're working with um, in this work and other parts of the work that Tyler, myself, John, and all of everybody on our team is working on as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, for that overview. Really appreciate that. Um, and I, I think that we may hear some more about seed saving from our next uh, presenter. Um, Les Benedict will be back to talk about some, some of his other work. And I, I already gave a little introduction to Les, but wanted to just say that um, a little bit more detail about him. 
Les is affiliated with the Aquasasne Task Force on the Environment and is the Assistant Director for the Environmental Division um, for the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe um, in Aquasasne, New York. He has been studying black ash and its decline since 1990, and he's authored and co-authored many foundational resources for ash management, including one of the first technical guides um, on black ash. And so, Les, I would invite you to share with us some of your some of your your experiences. Stories, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stories. Anything you've got. I disappeared. Here I am. <clears throat> All of these technical uh, trials here. Well, thank you, um, Alaire. I appreciate the introduction and uh, great presentations by by everyone so far. I'm I'm really encouraged by by the fact that um, we still have people working hard and diligently trying to find ways to conserve ash. And um, I think the best I can do is just tell some stories. Emily did a great overview of, of um, <clears throat> seed collection efforts and the reason why, and uh, when it had some details on, on the uh, collection effort in terms of documentation and, and recording information, which is so vital. Uh, as Alaire mentioned, I started out in, on this path in my, in my life's journey about, th well, it's going on 31 years now. And I've met a lot of people, I've gone to a lot of a lot of the First Nations in Canada, um, as far as Manitoba, throughout Ontario, Quebec. Uh, I visited up in, in Maine uh, a couple times, joined forces with the Maine Indian Basket Alliance um, at the outset. At the very beginning of this effort, it was not about trying to uh, stop EAB or trying to um, mitigate the issues that would, would be created by EAB. It was simply about bringing a tree back to our community. And that's all it was. It, it really, that's all it really was. And there wasn't a lot of interest. I can say that over the years, unfortunately, EAB has, has um, created a situation where when I first started off with this, no no one except the the Native Americans cared about black ash as a species. It was very obscure in terms of references. You were lucky maybe to find one or two articles about it. And I'm very encouraged by, by folks like um, Tyler, uh, who can, who's continuing to carry, carry the torch on this, and Emily, uh, Susan Greenlaw, and they're supported by a great bunch of folks like uh, that I've gotten to know over the years, like Dr. Bridgen, who is now retired from the SUNY ESF Ranger School, John, Rant, um, John um, Darren Ranco and John Daigle. They continue to inspire students and continue to um, <clears throat> help them um, develop more information about, about the species in, in specific, but also it adds to the knowledge about ash species overall. So all of this work is very important. Um, I'd like to note that we have an attendee who, who is actually an expert in, in ash management as well. That's my brother, Mike Benedict. He uh, texted me, he said, I'm on, I'm on. <laughs> so I checked the list and sure enough, he's there. So he's spying on me. Thanks, Mike. Good, good to have your support. So I think, uh, I guess, where do I begin? I'm gonna put up a picture and, and just talk a little bit. And Alaire, if, if I go over time, just um, yell at me or something, or you can't throw anything at me because it's a virtual conference. But this picture represents uh, one of the efforts that we had. Um, a couple of close friends here, uh, as well as, um, I don't know if anyone recognizes uh, the gentleman on the right in the red, that's Bob Carfo. Whenever, when you pick up some uh, references on seed collection, seed management, seed biology, uh, you're gonna see Bob Carfault's uh, name on there. He basically wrote the book. Um, he's a fantastic guy. He's retired now, unfortunately, but I hear, I 
been in touch with him off and on, um, totally by random chance. Um, that his effort was to collect seeds and try to develop some EAB resistant trees through his labs. He actually worked out of Purdue University and also worked out of, I think, the uh, USDA office out of Dry Branch, Georgia. Um, so I had an amazing opportunity to work with him for, for a few days uh, in the early 2000s. And on the left is, is my uh, co-worker, Richard David. He's since retired. And we've been on a lot of trips. He actually coordinated a lot of trips in Canada uh, for us uh, so we could do our collections. In the center, in the yellow is David Arquette. He's um, actually the vice chair and treasurer for the Opposition Task Force on the Environment. He's been a member of that organization for as many years as, as, I, as I have been for about 30, 30 plus years. And the gentleman in orange is was our forest technician at the time, uh, Satanta O'Kaley. Um, so he, he went. He was he was um, very inspired about seed collection. He's gone his own way now. But you can see in the back background, uh, you can see our seed collection tools, which are fairly simple. It looks like Bob's got a GPS device. He's plotting that that stand. And this particular stand, um, this is now the target of integrated pest management activity that's being coordinated with the U.S. Forest Service and with USDA APHIS, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, Plant Protection and Quarantine, um, who we've had a long-standing relationship over the years for EAB surveillance. And as you can see, everybody is wearing boots and rain gear. One of the, one of the things that you learn about working with black ash is you're going to get your feet wet. That, uh, that's a given, no matter what. So, uh, and, and so it's quite an experience. Um, I was fortunate to have, to have Richard. He was actually, I, I think I'm as, at one time I was, I'm as old as he was when he first started. I think it was in his mid fifties. I was in my thirties at the time. So I told him one day, I said, Richard, I said, we've been doing this a long time. I said, well, I'm at the same age you were when, <laughs> when we were starting off with this and, and we shared a lot of different stories in our, in our travels we got to meet a lot of different uh, first nations people we were welcome into the communities uh, as well as the uh, tribal nations across the great lakes and the northeast so by far that was one of the most i guess one of the most um, important experiences that I, that I ever had in addition to to being a being able to go out collecting seeds for uh, for black ash. As I mentioned, our 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 journey started, or our past and our life journey started when our community said that hey, we we don't have as many black ash trees as we would like, and we have to go further and further away. And so our effort at that time was to go out and collect seeds and learn how to uh, germinate the seeds and how to care for the seedlings and, and to get them out into the in, into plantations, which we did uh, for seed plantations, but also put them back out into the environment. So we managed to do that. And Richard and I were, were fairly satisfied with what we had done. And then we were starting to think of us. And then we suddenly were informed that there is this insect that was devastating ash trees in the state of Michigan. And we looked at each other and said, well, what are we going to do now? And well, we said, we're, we're going to have to go back and try to learn as much as we can about this insect and find out what we can do. And at one point, we actually joined forces with the USDA um, seed. Um, it's a seed storage center in Fort Collins, Colorado. And the, the gentleman's name with that organization was Dave Ellis. And he saw what we were doing and he supported what we were doing. And so we developed a work plan where we actually took seed collection on the road for a number of years. And we went as far as we could to First Nations and to tribal communities to give them the very tools that you see in this pic in this picture. We gave them uh, 
basically pruning hook um, and root and tarps. And plus, we uh, worked with them. We taught them the basics of ash identification. And it consisted of some classroom instruction and then field instruction. So we talked about um, tree identification. We talked about um, handling and storage. We followed all of the recommendations that Bob had written about, we had never met Bob until this point. So we were working off of his documents in terms of how to take care of seeds. And we worked with Dave Ellis. Uh, he provided some additional information about how to treat seeds and dry them down so that they could be put in cold storage. So we did that for a number of years, and, and I think we were fairly successful with that. Um, I think the only thing our only regrets is we had so little time. We did. Our goal was also to inspire others to collect seeds, and and I'm not really sure how successful we were, but it's it's my hope that we were successful because we weren't able to go back to those communities and find out if they had actually collected seeds or not. But um, it it seems that the word got out because every now and then. I had folks from other First Nations. I think I even had folks from, I think Nova Scotia get in touch with me over the years and say, hey, we, we, had, we got a copy of your book. And we, we've heard about what you're doing. And, you know, we chat on the phone and, and discuss what their plans were and what they were up against and just share information with them and offer them some advice and encouragement as well to, to continue to forge ahead. As I mentioned, we're at the point in Akwazesne, we're, we're combating uh, EAB in customary usage areas, which include state forest. We forged a very strong relationship with New York State DEC, which is a difficult thing to do to begin with because the tribes are usually at odds with the state over a number of uh, issues. But this is one area where we've had fantastic support from, from the state, from, you know, from the ground up, from the field offices on up to the headquarters in Albany, New York. And up to the point where we've actually been invited in to participate in comment and review of the state forest Man stewardship plan. I, I was very proud to be a part of that process over the past uh, couple of years and actually got to the point where we had acknowledgments in their state plan as well as their local plans about the need for uh, managing ash as well as other resources that Native Americans use in the state forest. Whereas before we were diametrically opposed in terms of um, confrontations with uh, New York State Environmental Conservation Officers when people were collecting uh, medicine plants or even um, conducting um, hunting. Um, and, it's been, it's been a long battle. I, I think the successes are not only with, with ash uh, management, but have extended to other areas as well. And so I, I guess overall that, that would be uh, something that we could consider a success. So I think you've got a lot of good information from, from, uh, from the earlier presentation and we're going to take up any more time with regard to ash seed collection. I think I think an excellent job was done with that. But I think one of the questions I was asked um, maybe to, to think about was, well, what can we do now? And and what you know, what can we think about in terms of the immediate future? And I'm thinking about where we are and where the New England states are and thinking about where Maine is. They're really in a good they're really in a good position. You've got a lot of good um, information to work with. You've got a lot more information to work with than we than we had when we first started out. You've got a lot, a lot of support from USDA APHIS. You have a lot of good support from US uh, Forest Service, and you've got the other nations backing you guys up. Um, our good friends in, in Maine and Minnesota, uh, Michigan and Minnesota, they know what you're going to go through. They've been through it. Reach out to them and talk to them. They can share experiences with you. A uh, good friend, Kelly Church, who I got to meet uh, a number of years ago, is a basket maker out in Michigan. And she's been carrying on the fight out there to, to preserve uh, basket making as well as, as, well as uh, the ash trees. So you can't find a better group of people to work with. Uh, I work with uh, 
folks at the University of Maine over a number of years, participated in some conferences there, and they're doing really great work. Um, I would recommend that um, if you want to do something immediately, start um, working on forecasting for seeds this year if you want to collect some seeds and just get out there, find the trees now. They should be flowering. I was in a Brazier State Forest on Monday. And this, the seed crop doesn't look like it's going to be too good, but I was encouraged by some of the flowering that I did see. That was a good time to go out and take care of binoculars. You're a bird watcher as well. Um, you get a chance to maybe scout out some ash seeds, note where they are, maybe work within your own little local groups and do some seed collection. There's a lot of good resources. Uh, if you need some information about those resources and how to, I can steer you in the right direction. So I would just say, um, give you my encouragement to, to go ahead and, and start with some seed collection efforts. As far as First Nations are concerned, if there are any uh, private landholders, uh, if you can work with the First Nations, identify some uh, trees that could be harvested, uh, maybe for basket making to help them uh, continue their, their practices, that would be fantastic. Uh, but also keep in mind, too, that um, there's this whole concern concept of ash. Uh, so perhaps there's an opportunity for some of these ash to survive on their own. Um, that's, that's a matter of time and, and discussion. So th those are my um, those are those are my recommendations at this time. And I think I'll just close out of here if I can do this properly. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Guess I'm gonna ask, ask Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, Les. Um, I know uh, several years ago, or a couple of years ago, some of us in this group were at a um, an ash management um, sort of conference, black ash focused conference in Burlington, Vermont, and somebody there started out their talk by saying, you know, this EAB is is a devastating insect, but it also is bringing people together and i think that some of the stories that you told and some of the what what we're all witnessing here tonight of of this research um people connecting across agencies and tribal nations and states um geographically um we're we're all connecting and i think that the, the you, some of the stories you you share really exemplify that so thank you um and what less do you cut out for a little bit at the end when you were saying that this is a good time of year to get out and look at ash trees and see if they're flowering. So if anybody, um, if maybe Les, you could put your email in the chat if you're open to, to people contacting you if they would like some of those resources. So our, our last uh, presenter tonight, uh, before we spend just a few minutes on questions, um, is Dr. John Daigle. And Dr. Daigle is a citizen member of the Penobscot Nation. He's a professor in the School of Forest Resources at the University of Maine in Orono. Dr. Daigle received his PhD in forestry from the University of Massachusetts in 1997, and he has worked at the University of Maine since 1998. And since 2013, he has been researching ways that Wabanaki basket makers, um, tribes, and state and federal foresters, university researchers, landowners, and others, so that group we, that Les was just describing to us, um, how all of these people come together to prevent, detect, and respond to the threat of EAB. So prior to his present position at the University of Maine, Dr. Daigle served with the National Park Service as a park ranger and also with the U.S. Forest Service as a research forester. And he'll be sharing some of his research. Welcome, Dr. Daigle. Yes, well, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, but it's black still. I thought I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> it said end of slideshow, so you may need to try to start your slideshow again. Okay. Uh, okay. There we go. All right. Okay. Well, good. Um, Thanks uh, for the great presentations, um, you know, ahead of me. And I'll try to keep my presentation relatively short, you know, given the time. And I'm hoping that we can take questions too from the audience. 
um, you know, that have listened to the presentations. And I also want to thank you, Alaire uh, and Ginger, for organizing uh, this event. Um, and also acknowledge the work that you've done, or, you know, around, you know, Black Ash and some of the papers that you've written to bring more awareness about Black Ash. And uh, I don't know if you could link that in the chat to others, but I think uh, the people, you know, the audience would also be interested in, in the great work that you've been doing. So thank you. And uh, so, um, yeah, one thing I'd like to, you know, start out with is that this is a, you know, this is a research project that's not a project that you collect data or you put out on your results and then you're done within one or two years. You know, this is a project that I've been working on for, oh, close to 10 years and it's going to continue to evolve as EAB evolves across the landscape of the United States and, you know, makes more inroads in our state. Uh, but it's a continual process, I think, as we think about responding to and adapting to uh, EAB and, and unfortunately the diminishing ash that's gonna result, uh, you know, with EAB coming through our landscape. And, you know, this project uh, first started, what, you know, really, uh, again, uh, you know, with background, my grandparents were basket makers. Um, I used to help them make baskets and who would have thought that later on as a professor, I'd <laughs> be uh, researching you know EAB, um, but that's the case, and um, it's it's incredibly important to me uh, because basket making is important. Uh, the actual practice of basket making as a way to of expressing yourself, and it just it has very important cultural significance. It really identifies a lot of tribal communities here in the Northeast, as well as as far as you know Michigan and Minnesota, where they actually make. Uh, baskets from uh, black ash. And uh, another motivation for, can, you know, starting work around black ash in the face of the emerald ash borer was, again, let's mention this, there wasn't a whole lot of research around black ash because historically it hasn't been a, an important commercial forest uh, tree. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to bring more awareness of, of, of black ash most of the EAB research that started to, you know, it started as a result of the emerald ash borer focused around green ash and white made perfect sense because of a lot of, a lot of the green ash that we plant, that we have planted in cities and towns across, you know, the country and the commercial significance of white ash. But again, I think more visibility needed to happen around the black ash. And I think that's, that's really started to happen in recent years, especially. And Another aspect, uh, you know, related to this, what I see is the incredible importance of kind of collaborating efforts with the early research where basket makers had heard about EAB being in Michigan uh, from the basket makers in Michigan. Uh, this was when it was actually still kind of contained within just that one state. Um, you know, we started to reach out and uh, learn more about this. And, it, and we learn more about, you know, the ecologists, the, you know, the foresters and so forth in terms of the dynamics of EIB, EAB and how quickly it was starting to spread across, you know, into different states and so forth. So there was a lot of knowledge and information that was really desired from the basket makers just to learn more about the EAB, its dynamics how it's impacting trees and how, fa how fast is it spreading across the landscape. And likewise, uh, you know, there was a lot of interest in Maine with the Forest Service um, and, and federal forest researchers to learn more about black ash and the cultural significance of this tree. So it was a really good group of people that started to, you know, share ideas, share information, to kind of help to plan and address EAB coming in. And I just want to, again, acknowledge Les, who uh, was uh, right there from the start, coming over from New York and coming with his seed collection instruments uh, and just a wealth of knowledge. And his brother, Mike, I guess, hopefully he's still on the call, Mike Benedict, who's also a forester, who did it early research. He was one of the first uh, researchers that did black ass research um, 
from the University of Minnesota, and we had him come to Maine and share his his knowledge as we thought through, you know, kind of planning steps with EAB approaching. Um, I want to, you know, it's been a great group of people who have who have had working together over the years, and by design, we really wanted to broaden out our research to include Indigenous peoples from Michigan, um, just to see the effects that it's having and, um, and, and you know, in culture access and so forth. And um, again, let's mention Kelly Church, who's with the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. And she was phenomenal uh, sharing knowledge and information as, as we were planning. We actually made a trip to Michigan, and, th and this is a black ash harvester here, and also a, a fabulous basket maker. Uh, he's won national awards with his baskets. We went and looked at kind of firsthand uh, EAB impacting uh, black ash trees. And I don't know if you can see over here, one of the things, again, in terms of thinking about, um, you know, kind of bringing more awareness, our team of black ash harvesters actually went to some of the research labs that were created in Michigan because that's the hot spot where EAB first was detected. And we actually pounded black ash there where the researcher could, could see black ash and kind of what it's used for. And uh, it really kind of enlightened them in terms of the cultural importance of ash, you know, with some of the research they were do doing in terms of studying EAB. Um, this is Richard Silliboy, another harvester of black ash. Um, uh, the basket maker and uh, and Butch Jacobs, again, key tribal members that, that have been part of our research efforts over the years. And so I I, I want to just um, again just to you know for time I just want to uh, indicate some of the work that we were able to do as kind of a team when EAB was first detected in Michigan. I think it may have started to overlap into a few other states. We had gotten together so that um, we were able to address the state legis le legislatures at, at Maine, and we uh, were able to get an emergency order to ban firewood. And this was pretty early on, um, and I think that in part was why EAB was, um, we were able to kind of keep it out of our state. It's in now, but we were able to keep, keep EAB out of our state for quite some time. But we were mobilized as, as a group of people uh, kind of united and it wasn't just uh, the tribal communities but we had the U.S. Forest Service, uh, State Forest Service also kind of justifying the need for considering a ban on uh, importation of uh, out-of-state firewood into the, to our state. We also initiated other research projects knowing that the biological dispersion of the AB um, is really quite small, you know, in terms of its ability to, to spread and the real culprit kind of uh, being kind of people transporting firewood um, for camping or for heating their homes. And we were able to do some research. We, we surveyed campers in Maine, New, New, uh, New Hampshire and Vermont, looking at uh, their behaviors around uh, camping and transportation of firewood. And we were, and we learned some very interesting things in that uh, most people were leaving their firewood at home, which was a good thing, but others were still bringing their firewood with them when they went camping. And the reason was that they wanted to save money, even though that they knew AAV was in the proximity, um, but they thought their firewood was safe and they were trying to save some money. Um, and so it's clear that we still need to kind of continue our outreach efforts to inform the public about the dangers of transporting firewood. Um, and I think that can go a long ways in our efforts to try to sustain a cultural practice on the landscape if we can slow that rate of spread of EAB. The other thing that we did as a group of, you know, was just to have a voice. Um, again, EAB had by this time spread to most states where ash is located, uh, but the, um, you know, the APHIS program was considering to deregulate quarantines, interstate quarantines. And of course that 
had our, a lot of our basket makers and harvesters upset because EAB hadn't even been in our state and they were going to deregulate. And we were able to form as a group at least to express our views during public hearings and other avenues, um, you know, to illustrate, you know, that it shouldn't be done. Um, it eventually did happen. It took a few years, uh, but um, I think they thought about it. But they eventually uh, did deregulate um, in having interstate transportation. But Fortunately, again, with the partners that were formed here in the state of Maine, we are still maintaining our quarantines in our, our state to try to contain where EAB is infesting our forests. Um, so we still are actively kind of doing quarantine work here in our state. And we're also, we've also uh, uh, worked with APIS so that we can still have the international border where there's monitoring going on with, with uh, ash coming into our state. And I think it's the team of folks like Les and others working together uh, really kind of creates a bigger voice and a bigger um, bigger impact. And um, and I think having those voices heard also was helpful because uh, again we were able to get some money to have that great conference in Vermont around Black Ash and bring kind of the latest science researchers in terms of their knowledge about EAB Black Ash as well as having a lot of the cultural knowledge keepers present at that meeting too, to, to, to share their information. And um, I, I guess I'm, I tend to be an optimist in terms of thinking about, you know, where EAB is going. Um, you know, there's more research that we need to do to understand, um, you know, this insect. I think one of the positive things, and again, we have a leading professor there at the University of Vermont, who's actually starting to devise ways of thinking about trying to sustain ash in our landscape. How can we manage our forest to try to optimize the likelihood that maybe it can sustain on the landscape? I think that's a very positive view where we can start to think about how, how, we, can, how we can try to keep ash, you know, and try to sustain our cultural practices and not give up. And, um, and, it, and uh, it's webinars like this, working with private landowners and others and the foresters that um, I think are going to be key as we as we think about the future of, of managing ash and trying to sustain our cultural practices which are so very important. So with that I think I'll stop so that we have a little bit of time for a few questions and I'll stop uh, my screen. Thank you, John. Okay. Thank you for all the work that you're doing to really elevate ash research and bring um, bring the next generation of researchers like Tyler and Emily along as well. Um, I would ask all of our presenters at this point to turn on your screens. We are just about at time, so I hope that um, you'll forgive me for just having a very short question period. I would actually like to just ask Tyler and Emily. Um, both of you, since you are just in the middle of doing research now, research that's kind of at the at that nexus between um, the culture, the practice, and sort of the more hard hard forestry science. Um, you know, we're in Vermont, um, and that and we have we have EAB. Um, we do not have as much of sort of the the foundations of research that you have over in Maine. Um, and so we would love to learn from you, and we have learned a lot tonight. But I think I would just ask that each of each of both of you, um, based on what you're finding so far in the protocols and the work that you're doing um, in Maine, what is the one piece of advice that you might give to us here in Vermont as we begin? We, you know, we aren't doing seed saving. We are doing you know some types of inventory, but not the, the exact type that you're describing, Tyler. What's one piece of advice that each of you would give to us in Vermont as we as we embark on this next stage of work? Emily, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, so I am far uh, more recently getting involved in this sort of research. Um, and I am kind of the social scientist of the group. 
um, and my my background uh, has come has been involved in working with a lot of um, indigenous groups actually across the Arctic. And I think that from what I've seen so far with at all of the partners and everybody who's working together in Maine is really the dialogue and keeping it open and, and talking to as many people as you can and um, just making those connections. Um, I think probably Tyler will have some more, you know, he's been involved in this a lot longer, so his he might have more concrete <laughs> things to say. Um, but I feel pretty strongly on the the networking part of this research. And, and that is a big part of the work that I will be doing um, can, going forward with my research. Mm -hmm. So um, always talking to other people and making those networks and uh, creating those relationships um, is, is how I is my idea of how to tackle this sort of stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was that was great, Emily. I um I agree that uh, you know community and having a strong community surrounding some of these issues and these efforts is really important. So I'd encourage anyone who is starting to come up with response plans, ideas for inventory or seed collection, um, Haudenosaunee, Abenaki. Wabanoki basket makers. Um, that's a wealth of knowledge that needs to be at the table and talked to uh, in those processes. <clears throat> um, it's something I've learned uh, when I started that it's it was insane. I had already started forestry school, but I would talk to just basket makers and community members in the Passamaquoddy and just crossing, and they would know more if not equal amounts about emerald ash borer uh, as I did uh, just because they have an interest and they're vested in the resource and the cultural value of it. Um, it's uh, definitely a, a focal point that if you focus on that and pull it out in your efforts, whether it be seed collection, inventory, um, it's gonna make it uh, that much better, so. Um, and then tribal communities always want to lift up youth. So if there's a, a possibility to incorporate an element where you bring in tribal youth, um, I'd encourage that that be a big aspect of any program that starts. Thank you so much. Well, I... I I think that it's been really wonderful on the course of this evening, hearing stories, hearing research, hearing about connections and relationships across hundreds of miles, um, all connecting um, around this one tree. And I think that this is, I hope, just the start um, or the next step in a, a journey together that we'll just continue to have and that we'll continue to work with each other across our, our state boundaries. and. Um, and those of us in Vermont really are, are grateful for those of you in New York and in Maine um, um, at Akwesasne and, and on tribal lands in Maine for coming to join us tonight. So with that, I am, would thank everyone and wish you all a lovely evening. And this will be recorded for future viewing. And we welcome you also to reach out to, to any of us who were uh, presenting tonight.